We are concluding our September sermon series this morning on the kingdom of God. So we're looking at the parables that Jesus taught, teaching about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, one of the most prolific topics in the New Testament and in the teachings of Jesus. And we started all the way back kind of defining the kingdom as this reality on Labor Day weekend of something that's far away. It's a place that we're going to eventually end up after our life's concluded, but it's also something that we can begin to experience now. And today we're kind of coming full circle as we talk about Jesus' parable of the talents, specifically the one in Luke's gospel, because at the beginning of this passage, Luke makes a point to bring out verse 11. And if you don't remember, verse 11 states here at the beginning of the uh, passage, as they listened to this, Jesus told them another parable because he was, because he was near Jerusalem and they thought God's kingdom would appear right away. So Luke thinks it's so important that Jesus is speaking to this crowd and that the crowd believes the kingdom is coming right away. And so Luke says in his gospel that this parable about the kingdom is a direct response to the crowd's wondering of when the kingdom will be here. So I want us as we go and look at this parable to have that in mind. The people thought the kingdom was coming immediately. They thought it was here and now. And then you see the, the parable, and it's a very common parable. It's usually known as the parable of the talents. And I have to apologize because I got out of Cal Pinto this morning and I forgot that their pulpit Bible and their, their congregational Bibles are all older translations, RSV, which is a, a English translation and proper English translation from England. And it's not the parable of the talents because they call money pounds over there, but it's the parable of the pounds in the pulpit Bible over there. So if no one wants to gain lots of pounds, well, the master's away. It also sounded really funny trying to translate all of the illustrations really quickly. But we come to the parable of the talents or pounds, if you're on the other side of the Atlantic, and it's a very simple parable at face value. A master goes away, he's called away on a diplomatic mission, and he takes his resources, his money, his talents in the Greek, and he gives it to several of his servants, and he gives his top servant the most resources, the most talents, about four months' wages per talent, so about 40 months' wages to this one servant, and then he goes down the list giving a decreasing amount until he gets to the very last servant, and he gives him one talent, a single talent, four months of wages. And then he comes back from the diplomatic mission, not a rousing success because the people aren't extremely happy with him as they send an envoy back home to tell the original servants that they don't want this guy, they don't like him, they don't want him to be over them. So the master comes back, probably not the best of moods, and he calls all his servants in and begins going down the road seeing what has happened. And he gets to the first one, as you can read and see, and he is produced a thousandfold. It's just amazing return. Like I said during the reading, he's the Warren Buffett of the ancient Near East. She's got this ridiculous return. He, he took the money, he invested it in the, into the Google or the Microsoft of his day before it became big, and, and it came back amazingly. And, and the master is excited, obviously. And he goes down the road with each of the servants, and the servants, the servants have rendered some sort of earning for the master off of the talents they were given. The money that was given in their, in his place to them, until they finally get to the last servant. And the last servant has a really interesting story. He presents the single talent back to the master, and he makes note, you know, he'd wrapped it in a scarf, or in translation, say, a napkin. 
and he just hit it. And the master comes back, and he is upset. Because the servant didn't even put the talent in the bank where he would have earned 1.18% interest at the local bank. Instead, he just sat. And when the master came back, all he had to show for it was the original talent he gave him. And the master, as a, the parable concludes, the master's upset and he wants to know, why didn't you do this? And, and the servant gives him a half-hearted explanation. Really, the servant says he's afraid of the master. And because of his fear of the master, his fear of the risk of investing the talent and the problem, or the fact that he might have actually lost something if he invested it, he was scared and he did nothing because of that fear. And so the master concludes the parable by taking the talent from the one and going all the way back over here to the first one and giving it to him, and then offering this explanation to all who have much, much more will be given, and to all who have nothing, even what they have, will be taken away. Now, if you remember what I said at the beginning, this parable is a response to the fact that Jesus knows the crowd thinks the kingdom is coming immediately. So the crowd is pressing around Jesus. They're seeking signs and miracles here in chapter 19. They think the kingdom is coming immediately and Jesus knows that. So he tells them this parable. The question for us today is how does this answer the fact that Jesus or the kingdom of God is coming immediately? How is Jesus addressing that thought that the crowd has? Because the parable standing by itself makes some sense. It seems pretty simple on its face. But in the context of chapter 19 in Luke's gospel, it's kind of confusing. The crowd thinks the kingdom is coming immediately and Jesus answers them with a parable about a bunch of servants and some talents in a far off land and the guy at the very end losing what little he had. That doesn't sound congruent, that doesn't sound the same as the kingdom that we talked about for the last four weeks. It doesn't sound like the kingdom that is, as we talked about in the second week, based solely on love, the kingdom that we talked about the third week is willing, is something worth sacrificing your whole life for. It doesn't sound like the kingdom we talked about last week, where the chief value of love is manifest or made real in the act of forgiveness or reconciliation. This doesn't sound like that kingdom on face value because it's so different and strange. But I want us to think for a moment about this idea of talents, because I honestly believe that this is a point in the text where God intended there to be a double entendre, some sort of double meaning of the word. Because in the original Greek, the word talent literally means some amount of money, an amount of wages. And the scholars who translated this version of the Bible used a four-month amount of wages, a higher amount of wages. Some scholars think it's less. But they all agree the word talent in the Greek means some sort of amount of money. It's not necessarily an abstract idea. It's a concrete idea. It's money. But I also think God wants and intends us to understand in this parable that talent means something more than money. Each of us has been given a gift by God. Each of us has been given abilities and resources at our disposal by God to do something with. And you can think about it going through your day and understand that you see people with specific and many times different talents than your own, and you can see how they're utilized to make the world a better place. For example, you can think of people who have a really good talent Maybe it's singing, that's the one that jumps off the top of the head for most people, because we all listen to the radio, or something in the car. We all hear people sing this morning, we all hear other people sing. Heck, some of us even pay money to go hear special people sing. 
That's a talent that God has given them. We do the same thing with sports. Some people have been gifted by God with athleticism and placed at a time in history where that sport is valued. And so they make a living with the talent of whatever sport it is they play. Some people have more talents than we could ever understand. Some people have specific talents. Some people have weird talents. It's a guy playing guitar with strings in a trash can at the state fair yesterday. <laughs> that is a very strange talent. Not, not my cup of tea. You know, you can plop me down in a kindergarten room, and I promise you I do not have the talents or the abilities to manage that room or to survive being in that room all day. But if you take a, a kindergarten teacher who has Yes, through some training hone that talent, they are able to dictate what those students need to learn in that classroom. They're able to maintain control and keep the students from burning the school down. And you can go down the list. You know, a police officer has a specific set of talents. An office worker has a specific set of talents. The folks who built the building we stand in this day have a specific set of talents. And if you look at all the various different talents of all the people in all the world, they all come from the same source. The, all the talents we have find their origin in the God who creates us. And much like the master in the parable, God doles these talents out to each of us, expecting something to happen. Expecting something in return. And therein, I believe, lies the reason Jesus answers the crowd's expectations of the kingdom with this parable. Because we have the choice with the talents we have. If we choose to advance God's kingdom, to live as faithful followers of Christ, and to dedicate the talents, gifts, and resources we have to that kingdom, then we can begin to see that kingdom immediately. Now, we won't see it fully. We won't see it completely realized. In fact, I don't believe that will happen for any of us until the conclusion of our own lives. But we can begin to see the kingdom each and every time we use our talents to further God's will. Every time we use our talents, our gifts, and our resources, we, if done in God's will, can see the beginning of that kingdom. So yes, in a way, he's answering the crown. He's saying, yes, if you use your talents, you can realize the kingdom of God immediately. Not fully, but immediately. It's a response to the crowd that if you live the way the faithful servants lived with the gifts, the graces, the resources, and above all else, the talents that my Father has given you, you can begin to see that kingdom today. Or you can do what the last servant did. And we can all think of someone like the last servant who is insanely talented, but for whatever reason has thrown that talent away and the opportunity that comes with it. I grew up uh, with a phenomenally gifted athlete in our hometown. This guy played running back, for those of you that are football fans, and you could give him the ball and no one could stop him. He was just unreal on how gifted he was. And it translated from high school to college, where he played in the Rose Bowl. He scored two touchdowns in a national title team in the Rose Bowl. This is a guy that was going to go beyond college and play in the pros 
National scouts were looking at him. They were talking about an NFL combine and going on and getting out of school early and making big money. And then he made a bunch of poor decisions that landed him in trouble with the law, you got him kicked off his football team, and became a footnote in college sports history. The sad thing is, this is an uncommon story. You can go down the list and look at famous artists, famous performers. You can look in the boardroom of America and look at famous managers and office workers. You can look in law enforcement and see people who have fallen out of the wayside because they're, even though they were so talented, they made poor decisions. It's easy to see catastrophic failure in the face of the gifts that God has given others when it is played out in a public manner like this individual. But I want to invite you also to realize the failure of the last servant isn't just this grand failing of some people put on pedestals like sports and artists and leaders. But I think the grand failing the inability to use God's talents that he has given you in some sort of return, it really happens more quietly on a day-to-day -day basis. You see, the failing of the final servant was his fear, his fear of loss and his fear of his master, his fear of the future. And yes, some people fail spectacularly with their talents, we feel like they waste golden opportunities given them, but so many more people fail when it comes to use their talents, gifts, and abilities that God has given them because they're afraid. They fear what is out there. They fear failure. They fear not being good enough. You can go down the list, but they're like the last servant. They fear the future for some reason, whether it's a fa fear of failure, whether it's a fear of not knowing what to do, whether it's a fear of leaving or difference or change. For whatever reason, they become controlled by it like the last servant to where they take that talent and they wrap it up and I really like one of the other Gospels, Matthew and Mark, when they get to this, this story. And they say, instead of wrapping it up and hiding it, they say the last servant dug a hole in the backyard and sat. And for a lot of people that are controlled by that fear, it's taking that talent that God has given us, those abilities, and we just dig that hole and we sit on it. And day by day, millions of people do this. And I think what God implies by this is that when you are controlled by that fear and don't allow God's talents to flourish and bring about the kingdom, when you become that last servant, when you do nothing with the gifts that are given to you, then you miss out on so much. But chiefly, you miss out experiencing the kingdom of God here and now. You miss out on seeing what the kingdom looks like now. One of the, one of the chief examples I have on that is our summer mission trip. Or really any mission trip, I just take the summer one because I've been on it dozens of times. But you can see the first fruits of that kingdom of God. Both in how people go out and serve in the middle of the summer, and how the people who they serve receive the gifts they give. Whether it's a new wheelchair ramp, or new paint, or a new roof. Folks, that is what the kingdom looks like. They, because they have done what the first group of servants have done in this parable, get to see immediately some part of the kingdom of God. And I would say the folks who miss out, who don't use their talents, their gifts, their resources, or even in this case the folks who stay home, they don't get to see that immediate kingdom. They lose sight of it. They fail to be part of it. 
And that's what this parable is about in terms of when the kingdom comes. You want to see the kingdom today. You want to step foot in the places where God has walked and be a part of what the Spirit is doing. Then commit the talents, the gifts, and the resources you have to furthering God's kingdom by being His hands and His feet in this world. You want to see the kingdom? Then love the people the kingdom loves. Use your talents, your gifts, and your graces. And people will come up and they'll, they'll say, well, you know, gifts and, and resources, that's easy. You know, we have an offering. You can put that stuff in the plate. You know, show us the kingdom now. But I want to really hammer home the talents part of that in closing. Because that's the hard one. For two reasons. One, it's hard to find where your talent fits in the kingdom. But two, and I think this is especially true in our day and age, it's hard to always know what your talent is. And I want to invite you to think about that and reflect on that real quick. I want you to look at your life and see the things that you're passionate about on one side. Understand what those are and see where that intersects the things that you're good at. So I can be passionate all day long about good food. And I am. I love to eat really good food. I'm a terrible cook. Ask my children. I've had to cook for them for the last month every night. I would not be talented at cooking. But you could look at it in many different ways. You might be passionate about music and it fills you, it inspires you to get up in the morning, and you are good at playing a banjo. I went to grad school in Kentucky. This example makes sense. Folks, in that case, playing the banjo and making music with it is a talent God has given you. You might be passionate about reading old dusty books somewhere. And you're really, really good at taking that old wisdom and putting it to use in a modern sense, then you might be talented leading a group of people and learning about God's will for them. You know, leading a Sunday school class. Leading a small group. Maybe you're really passionate about the music you hear and you know what? You're talented at singing. Well, maybe the choir is a place for you. Maybe you're really passionate about seeing people smile and learning about people and understanding people. And maybe you're really good at just communicating people. You know what a talent is that we don't talk about a lot in the church? Are those people who are just really good at building relationships. They're talented at building relationships and being friends. And we all have them in our lives because they're the first person we usually turn to when something bad happens or something really good happens. They're the first folks we go to celebrate with and they're the first folks that we go to cry on their shoulder. And you know what? That's a talent too. That is a talent too. But wherever your passion intersects what you're good with, Folks, those are the talents God has given you. And I want to invite you today to use those talents. Dedicate those talents, whatever they are, to God's kingdom. And I promise you, if you begin to dedicate those talents specifically to advancing God's kingdom, the things that you're passionate about and where they cross the things you're good at, and you dedicate that intersection to the work of God's kingdom, using it to become His hands, to become His feet. Folks, then, in that moment, you will see the kingdom of God. You'll see the kingdom that's here now, breaking into the world. You'll see the kingdom in part, that we fully realize one day when you stand face to face before Christ. If you do that, you will see the kingdom in all its glory. Amen.
In the name of God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.